he was kind, thoughtful, friendly. Pathological liar. At the time, when would have said an answer to prayer? Just what we needed. Access to death-dealing drugs. Always well-managed, very polite. Perfect predator. Good company outside and extremely popular with everybody. Trust of the victims. He was a nice guy. He was a good guy. Perfect killing machine. His patients were mainly elderly women, living alone and vulnerable. They adored their doctor, Harold Fred Shipman. And even when their contemporaries began dying in unusually high numbers, patients remained loyal. The number of patients that Dr. Shipman murdered is still unknown, but his murderous roll call eclipses the toll of any other serial killer caught to date. Did events in his life turn him to murder? Or, more simply, was Harold Shipman born to kill? Harold Frederick Shipman is an interesting case to examine. The very remarkable nature of his case is the fact that he was not remarkable. We could say he can't be a killer because he's a bit like us. Harold Shipman fitted in with society to a great degree, and this was the very important feature which made it possible for him to go on and on to be one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. For his victims, death came in the afternoon, but for Harold Frederick Shipman, it came in the early hours of the morning at Wakefield Prison on Tuesday the 13th, January 2004. Prisoner CJ8199, the expert in death, had timed his final act well. He was beyond saving. He'd been alive at 5 a.m. when the last check was made on him. And he knew the next check was not for another hour. As a doctor, he also knew that four minutes was the maximum time he needed. What he has done is he's taken to his grave the... Um reason and the motivation behind his killing and left everybody guessing in relation to that and uh, sort of perplexed uh, forevermore. His suicide caused shockwaves through Hyde, the town in Greater Manchester where most of his victims and their families lived. Hyde was such a lovely town, it was a proper old-fashioned traditional community where sons and daughters still lived on their the parents' doorsteps, and they all lived near each other, and they all understood each other. It was a very close community with a, a warm heart. So for Shipman to be able to kill so many people in such a, a small, safe community was doubly devastating. Over the years, doctors, funeral directors, and even pharmacists had raised suspicions about Dr. Shipman, but such worries were swept under the carpet. I found out that the police had actually investigated Shipman before in March 1998, um, quite soon after breaking the story. Um, I spoke to Dr Linda Reynolds and she was the GP who courageously went to the local coroner, John Pollard, and told him that she was worried that Shipman had killed his patients. On that basis, I then instructed the police uh, to make an investigation and that is what has now been referred to as the failed investigation because the police came back to me about a fortnight later and said they'd investigated and, and quite frankly they could find nothing wrong. The fact is they came back to Dr Linda Reynolds and told her she was mistaken, that Shipman was a, a pillar of, of the community and you know she must be careful what she's saying about such people. And um, Shipman went on to kill three more women after that. Dr. Shipman might have carried on killing for years if it had not been for the suspicious death of Kathleen Grundy, 
on the 24th of June 1998. The last person to see her alive was Dr. Harold Shipman when he'd gone to her home to take routine blood samples. When Kathleen Grundy died, she left a will. That will was made out in favour of Dr. Shipman, but her daughter, Angela Woodruff, got this copy of a will, and she was absolutely astonished because if you look at the actual will, it's so amateur. If you've got to forge a will, then you've got about two out of 10 for forgery. It simply wasn't very good. Kathleen Grundy's daughter believed that the signature was not actually her mother's, so consequently, uh, the document needed to be examined. The officer who was given the case to handle started talking to a couple of people he knew, one of them being the local undertaker, Alan Massey, who said, well, I've been really worried about the number of cremation certificates. I've uh, uh, mentioned it to people before they've taken no interest, but there's so many of them. There was the fact that Shipman's fingerprint appeared on it, when in actual fact, in interview, Shipman denied that he'd ever seen the will. The fact that Shipman actually owned the typewriter that the will had been typed on, and that in interview, he suggested that um, Mrs Grundy used to borrow the typewriter. But he couldn't suggest to us uh, who had returned it to him after the will had been prepared. It was decided that Kathleen's body needed to be exhumed and forensically examined to discover the true cause of her death. The investigation into Kathleen Grundy's death uh, was uh, undertaken uh, in the knowledge that uh, there had been an earlier investigation into Dr Shipman's activities. That had involved uh, 19 deaths. About a fortnight into the inquiry, there was uh, interest from a local newspaper. My news desk at the Manchester Evening News was tipped off about um, the death of Kathleen Grundy and the fact the police were investigating her GP. Um, I rang the police and they didn't want to comment any further. The police decided that the families of the 19 people who died should become aware of the reinvestigation before the story broke. I then went into hide to find out more about the case from the people who knew Kathleen Grundy. Almost immediately, I bumped into two old ladies and they said, oh, you mean Dr Death, dear? And I said, I beg your pardon. And they said, well, they say he's a good doctor, but you don't last. Uh, lots of old ladies have died with Dr Shipman. The family members then told us very similar stories uh, to the story that we had already uncovered in relation to Kathleen Grundy. Uh, that is when I started to realise that this was much bigger than one uh, death uh, that Dr Shipman uh, had been involved in. We carried out the exhumation uh, and uh, a pathologist actually performed a post-mortem. Shipman, of course, had certified the death at the time it had occurred as being old age. He could not confirm the cause of death that Shipman had put and consequently we sent um, samples off for analysis. There were levels of uh, diamorphine in the body of the deceased which were sufficient to have led to her death. Of course, Mrs Grundy had not been suffering from any uh, serious illnesses that required her to be uh, administered diamorphine. At that stage, I was totally convinced that they were on to someone here who had committed many heinous crimes. The community were absolutely wholeheartedly behind Dr Shipman at this point. He'd, he'd groomed that community so that they truly believed in him and thought that he was looking after them, when in fact he was killing them by the hundred. The kind of victims he picked, the elderly people, are what we call the category of less than dead. In other words, the kind of people that, if they passed away, you don't actually notice so well. Um, they're not the kind of people that are going to cause a big fuss because almost it's expected. And in fact, um, counter to most serial killers, he's one of the few people who could probably get the relatives or the council to take away the body for him. The way in which the victims were found was in itself quite disturbing. 
Many of them were found fully clothed uh, in the middle of the daytime, often sitting upright in a chair or on a sofa. In some of those cases, Shipman had actually certified on the cremation form that he'd carried out a full external examination of the body, and yet the victim was still sitting there, fully clothed, shoes on, uh, you know, the, the sleeves buttoned down to the wrist, dresses that buttoned to the neck. Well, how you can carry out a full external investigation in those circumstances, I, I just don't understand. Often in the medical notes which he'd made up, um, suggesting that these people had had heart conditions, for example, when they hadn't really, um, and then saying, well, they must have had a heart attack. Um, of course, somebody having a heart attack doesn't just simply fall asleep, sitting in a chair, looking very relaxed. Life just isn't like that. Police investigated Shipman's book of death certificates. They made a list of 15 deaths that they decided should be investigated as a priority. Of the victims on this list, nine had been buried and six cremated. More exhumations were ordered. Police also learned that Dr. Shipman had often encouraged the relatives of his victims towards cremation. In each of the exhumations that took place, tests were carried out, and in most of those, uh, morphine was discovered in the body, and that led to a prosecution in relation to that death. The police inquiry would also reveal Shipman's modus operandi. He would often kill his victims, most of whom were elderly, with an injection of morphine, and then return to his office to falsify their medical records on his computer to exaggerate their poor health. In the case of Kathleen Grundy, he had backdated several entries to suggest she'd become addicted to morphine. The thought of an 80-odd-year-old former Lady Mayoress of the town of Hyde scoring bags of heroin in the back streets of Manchester seems to me ludicrous and ridiculous and a gross insult to her memory, quite frankly. Being a GP placed Harold Shipman in a position where, in public, he could actually carry out the very activities that in private he wished to carry out and actually project them in the community and wander around the community and make it quite clear to people that, you know, I am a great doctor. On the 7th of September, 1998, Shipman was arrested on suspicion of murder. Who was the real Dr. Shipman? What made him a monster? In order to actually find out about this actual behavior and how it developed, we have to look back in time very closely at his childhood and even beyond. In September 1998, Harold Shipman was convicted for 15 murders. The Shipman inquiry now documents that he killed 284 people over a period of 30 years before he aroused suspicion. However, no one really knows the true number of his victims. The Shipman case is unusual. There was no highly publicized trail of bodies, no madman on the loose. Until Shipman was arrested in connection with the Kathleen Grundy case, no one could have known just how many murders had taken place. If we wish to find out whether Harold Shipman was in fact born to kill, we need to examine early childhood looking for patterns of behavior which would indicate that they carry traits, that their temperament is different. With Harold, we realize that on the surface, it seems like a very ordinary childhood, a very ordinary background. But if we dig deeper, we know that there are going to be clues as to why he ended up where he did. Harold Frederick Shipman, nicknamed Fred or Freddy, was born into a working-class family on June the 14th, 1946, in Nottingham. He was a distant and slightly aloof child, maintaining a distance between himself and his contemporaries, mainly due to the influence of his mother, Vera. I think his mother uh, certainly um, encouraged him to the, uh, about the path of righteousness, but uh, she thought Fred was special. She wanted him to be special. And now he was the middle child. The elder sister, Pauline, left school at 15, was no great academic. His brother, Clive, wasn't as bright as younger brother, 
uh, but Fred uh, brought up in a decent and fairly new council estate in Nottingham. Passed his 11 plus, uh, got into the local grammar school, High Pavement, which was extremely prestigious. To do so, he studied hard. He didn't mix very much with local kids. And his parents, like my parents, like lots and lots of other working class parents, would have, would have been so proud. Our boy is going to the grammar school. Shipman's school days at High Pavement were largely unspectacular. Like so many other grammar school entrants, he went from being one of the bright kids at junior school to being run of the mill amongst so many other clever boys. Fred was very serious, and I, I think it, it may be that um, he had to work harder than the, the, the most. And I know he had a real respect for his family, and I think he, he thought that they'd made an effort, his parents had made perhaps a sacrifice. His mother really didn't want Fred to be, as it were, in this area and have the same kind of career as other boys. And having him focus exclusively on his studies meant that Fred was not really integrated into the real world. And he was allowed to build up fantasies, fantasies of power, and fantasies that perhaps might have had a sexual connotation because Fred was not really allowed to develop socially and sexually normally. Vera decided who Fred could play with and when. She wanted to distinguish him from other boys. She was more ambitious for Harold than her other children. Perhaps because he seemed that more mature, he seemed that much older. And when certain incidents occurred at school, which perhaps had it been anybody else, you'd, you'd have had a good laugh and you'd have made him pay for it. With, with Fred, he didn't. One of the best examples of that is, is the other rugby club dancers that, that we had. He turned up with his sister. And they used to dance together in this strangely uncoordinated way, totally different. And I think she was taller than him as well. We just respected him. It's strange. The fact that Fred got respect from his friends um, is a little bit surprising because of his social alienation. However, by playing it by the rules, by creating an act, Fred just simply coexisted with these people and formed no real um, problem in relating to other people. So. He was able, if it were, as it were, just to slot in. He didn't really have any difficulty because he didn't create any difficulty. On Friday the 21st of June 1960, when Fred was just 17, his mother Vera died of lung cancer, an illness that he had kept strangely secret from his classmates. The family GP visited the house regularly in the weeks before Vera's death giving her welcome injections of morphine in ever-decreasing dosages. He met schoolmate Michael Heath on his way to school the following Monday morning when he told him his tragic news. Most days, Fred would be coming along, along the road here from his house and uh, we, we would meet at the bottom of the road here and, and we'd stop here and just say a few words and then we'd walk, walk on to the school. And um, it was on, on one of those, those mornings, Monday morning, when um, I met him at the point just there and just asked him what sort of week weekend he's had and he was then he said, oh, my mum had died, his mum had died and, um, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a shock really. Fred never said anything to me other than once on a bus I seem to remember him saying, my mum's not very well. But that could have been that she'd got a cold. That must have been terrible. What, what, what did you do? How did you cope? And he said, well, I put my gear on, went for a run, and he ran in the pouring rain, so he must have been absolutely saturated. He grieved in a very strange way. He ran for months and months and months. All through the night, uh, in his school running shorts and T-shirts, and uh, it was quite an amazing thing. He just seemed the same as he did any other day. But he must have been going through hell for weeks and months before. Fred would be the one who sat with her and waited for the doctor to come round and to give her an injection of morphine. And he was at her bedside when she died. And that was a moment that obviously impacted on him greatly. Here's the school gates to so what was the school. Um, there's, there's ten minutes on, on that particular morning that he told me that it was mum and dad, but mm, awkward, to, to, to say the least. And I must admit, when, when we arrived, it was a bit of a relief 
for us to go our own separate ways. It's interesting that he'd shown no interest in medicine or said he wanted to be a doctor until after his mother passed away. Many have drawn the comparison between Fred's experience of his mother dying under morphine and his later use of morphine to actually execute the old ladies. Now, there has to be a connection, and very few people have actually drawn why one leads to the other. If you look back in Fred's history, he constantly used exercise. Exercise generates what we call endorphins. Endorphins are extremely powerful opiates, a hundred, sometimes a thousand times more powerful than heroin. Now, Fred was accustomed to this, if you like. When his mother passed away, he experienced what many people experience when a family member finally passes away after a gruelling period. He felt relief. He felt a certain lifting. And this experience was then compounded because he went out for whatever reason and ran all night. And that extra opiate running around his body will have given Fred a euphoric high. Hence, this situation was likely to be repeated and give him pleasure in the future. Fred failed to get the grades he needed to study medicine at Leeds Medical School. Common with many serial killers with lower self-esteem, they always aspire to be better than... They want to be up with their peers. To be, you know, they, they envy their peers. Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler, always wanted to be a cop. Everybody, all his schoolmates, were all succeeding round him with good grades. He was a failure. They're always scrabbling to get out, scrabbling to get somewhere. After resitting his exams the following year, he was eventually accepted into Leeds Medical School in 1965. Did Shipman decide to become a doctor to save people or to have the power to kill them? When Shipman first went to Leeds, he regularly got a bus into Leeds every morning. And on that same bus, with, there was a young girl called Primrose Oxterby who, like Shipman, had had a rather austere upbringing. She had left school at uh, 15 without any qualifications, and she got on to uh, an art and design course uh, at a college in Leeds. And on that bus, it was uh, the very good-looking at the time, Shipman, and they hit it off. But very quickly after meeting, after about six months, she was pregnant. Shipman was careless, reckless for the first time in his life. They got married at uh, a register office. There isn't even a photograph in existence of that wedding. Shipman qualified from Leeds Medical University and went on to Pontefract General Infirmary to train as a junior doctor. After 12 months, he was duly licensed to practice medicine. According to the Shipman inquiry, this was where his first recorded murder took place. The Shipman Inquiry found that he killed a four-year-old girl, for example, and, and she was very, very ill and, um, and dying. And her mother left the room saying, please be kind to her, and he took that as his cue to kill her. Uh, he might have pretended that he, that was euthanasia and that he was doing that child a favour, but he wasn't because that child didn't die in her mother's arms. Her mother was having a cup of tea in the hospital cafe. So I think even then he had a very cruel streak that wanted to end lives, come what may. It is absolutely uncertain exactly where Harold Shipman began to kill people. It may have been uh, the case of the four-year-old girl, but we do know that as he approached that time, Harold will have had some swelling and some strangely unexplicable, pleasurable feelings um, that were probably associated with the event with his mother. And he would suddenly start to feel he was in that powerful role, that controller of life and death. In a way, it harks back to that very moment when he thought he should be that GP by his mother's bedside. By 1974, he was a father of two and had joined a medical practice in the Yorkshire town of Todmorden. In this North English setting, Fred seemed to change character. He became an outgoing, respected member of the community in the eyes of his fellow medics and patients. But moving into general practice as a junior partner was clearly very attractive. And he went and worked uh, at the Abram Ormerod practice in Todmorden, where there was illness among the partners. And Dr. Michael Grieve welcomed him with open arms. 
he was extremely good, almost manic in the way he carried out his duties and brought us all the latest techniques and kept us very much up to the mark. He was really, you know, at the time, one would have said an answer to prayer, he, just what we needed. The doctors did not choose their patients. The patients chose the doctor that they liked. And Fred had quite a devoted following who, who felt that he was the bee's knees and would do the best for them in all circumstances. Harold Shipman underwent a metamorphosis. He changed from being the very asocial uh, mummy's boy uh, who didn't really get on very well with people into a GP who would establish himself in this area and find that suddenly he could relate to people and grow, if you like, as a pillar of the community. However, Harold Shipman did have a different agenda. But the staff in the medical offices where he worked saw a different side of the young practitioner. He wouldn't delegate, he wouldn't let the nurses give injections for him, for instance. He wouldn't let the pathology technicians, when they came out once a week to take blood samples for patients. Now, Fred would insist on doing all these himself. Nobody had any idea that he was uh, guilty of any kind of malpractice, although it would emerge later in Todmorden that there was an instance where three patients of his died in one day. And for a long time, one of them, Eva Lyons, was thought to be his very first victim. But the village doctor wasn't as perfect as the fellow GPs thought it was discovered that he had a drug addiction. One of the other doctors in the practice uh, happened to be in the pharmacist, and she opened the book and said, yeah, well, you should look at this, you know. And there were scores of entries, and he'd amassed huge amounts of pethidine, clearly not for patients, but for himself. Well, he said he was addicted to pethidine because they were told um, you shouldn't give your patient anything that you haven't tried yourself. And finding that it sustained him in his manic state, because he was quite manic in what he would do, he'd take on these enormous loads and get through them. And perhaps the pethidin was what enabled him to do it. And he was so sorry, Fred, you'll have to go. And he booted his medical bag across the surgery where they in the middle and stodgy then. And off he went. He thought that I was the devil incarnate. And uh, I never spoke to him again. It is that point when a serial killer is confronted with the obvious, they retreat. Either with the excuse, society's fitted me up, it's not my fault, or they explode. And that's what Shipman was basically doing. How dare these little doctors, these little people, these, these people that are lower than me, how dare they question me, how dare they? Because he believes, he's, he's got this thing, how dare they? these people are much lower than me. My mother's always taught me this way. How dare they interrogate me? Who are they? Shipman was ultimately forced out of the practice and into a York Drug Rehabilitation Centre in 1975. Two years later, his many convictions for drug offences, prescription fraud and forgery cost him a surprisingly low fine of 600 pounds. After about a year or so, he saw uh, an advert for uh, a junior partner in a practice and hired and he applied for it. And when he went there, he was totally open about his uh, previous drug habits and said, look, I'm completely clean, I was under enormous stress. The General Medical Council is going to allow me to carry on working as a doctor, and I'd love another chance. And they believed him and took him in. In 1977, he was accepted to practice in the Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, and it was here that he felt free to kill. You know, Hyde's not a very big town, and, and obviously we had a shop. We knew lots of people that were Fred's patients, and everybody seemed to have the same 
um, opinion that he was a caring guy. You know, he's, he just seemed a normal guy. Again, he played the role of the dedicated, hardworking and community-minded doctor, highly respected in the area and making many friends. We went to a couple of social functions with them. They were good company outside and extremely popular with everybody that was there. Giving the impression the guy was just a normal guy, you know. Harold Shipman found it very much more comfortable to kill and be in Hyde. Um, Hyde was a fairly small, naive community where he would be accepted, this you know, tweed-wearing, friendly, local GP character. Harold Shipman had had um, what we call career development as a killer. He had actually developed as a killer to the stage of being Dr. God. The early 90s saw Shipman set up his own practice, having fallen out with his fellow doctors. This new practice attracted a large number of patients. I think Shipman went into single-handed practice purely to continue killing. Clearly, if he worked on his own, uh, nobody would know exactly what he was up to. Most times he was OK, but the odd time he was a bit off, offish. So, you know, you, you tend to wonder what were those days? Were those days maybe when something happened? You don't know. It makes you think. Because of the nature of the Shipman case, it may never be possible to document the exact number of murders he committed. The number and patterns of deaths in Dr. Shipman's practice was examined. When it was compared with those of other practitioners, significant differences appeared. Notably, that the rate of deaths of elderly patients was disproportionately high. Other variations appeared. Deaths were often clustered at certain times of the day. Patients' records and previous symptoms were mismatched, and Dr. Shipman was usually in attendance. The question remains, why wasn't he stopped earlier? In order to ascertain why Harold did what he did, you have to examine those little chinks, those flaws that show a glimmer under the surface of this projection as the good doctor, as the average man. In this macabre tale, Dr. Shipman's former patients are grateful he was finally stopped. Could they have been next? And there's little doubt that some owe their lives to a determined and intelligent woman named Angela Woodruff. Determination to solve a mystery about her mother's will helped ensure that on Monday the 31st of January 2000, the jury at Preston Crown Court found Shipman guilty of murdering 15 of his patients and forging the will of Angela's beloved mother, Kathleen Grundy. It's difficult to believe that we were friends with um, Fred Shipman, who, who was one of the, the biggest serial killers in Great Britain. But uh, when he's such a normal guy, he, he just fooled everybody. He shouldn't be playing God anyway. Nobody should be doing that. Many of his victims lived on their own. Um, a lot of them um, used to regard his visits to them as being something to look forward to. There were many instances of them being dressed in their best clothes, as if they were getting a visitor and it was something to look forward to and therefore, you know, let's put on something nice because the doctor's coming to visit. That was all part of this um, great power trip that he was on, that their last words would have been, thank you, doctor. Mistake number one, Shipman's use of the drug morphine. Morphine is one of the few poisons that can remain in body tissues for centuries. There are other substances which he could have used which would have been either less traceable or even not traceable at all uh, within the body. Why he chose to use diamorphine, I don't know. One reason might be that he was simply not quite as clever as he thought he was and didn't realise that it would be so traceable so easily. The other reason may be that he actually was quite willing and wanted to be found out at some stage. Mistake number two, 
the typewriter and the badly forged will. So when Shipman murdered Mrs Grundy and forged a will, what was happening? Did he want to get caught? Uh, was he looking for a way out or what? Uh, having killed 283 people, uh, we can, and it comes to Catherine Grundy, well, anybody's fair game. He's not been found out so far, so far, even though he most certainly should have been. But the fact is, he was a hospital doctor and a GP who was never challenged. I was very surprised to see that will and, and what a mess it was. So I think at that point, maybe he wanted to get caught. On the other hand, maybe he felt invincible. I think that Harold was becoming a little bit paranoid as to whether he was in safe territory and he was testing the ground to find out whether or not people were suspicious of him and also to prove to himself that he could talk his way out of this amongst these people that were his intellectual inferiors. His actual reason for doing it, I'm not sure, I must be honest, I really don't know. I think he expected to set the world on fire, but instead he faced a series of setbacks. He got Primrose pregnant while he was a medical student. He became addicted to pethidine and was caught. So in the end, he was quite disappointed with what he appeared to be. He was quite small and lowly, um, quite a, a small man. And I think that disappointment fueled an anger and an addiction to killing. Certainly there is grandiosity involved. He uh, acted like a supreme being, a godlike figure, who clearly had the power over life and death, and he chose to kill people at a time when he wanted to kill them. So why did he kill? Some speculate he hated older women, citing comments he made about the elderly being a drain on the health system. Others feel he was recreating his mother's death scene in order to satisfy some deep masochistic need. I think his mother's death informed the murders, um, gave him a theme, but I don't think it's the reason. A lot of people lose their mothers when they're teenagers to cruel and painful diseases, and we don't all go out and start killing hundreds of people. I think he had a personality disorder to start with, but the fact that his mother used to wait for him um, to return from school, sitting in the window with a cup of tea and the doctor would turn up and give her a morphine and that was her relief from the terrible pain of the cancer. I think that was very important to him when he did start killing. The first time that Harold Shipman actually killed someone, it is probable that in his mind there was rising pleasure associated with the incidence of his mother's death. At that point, he will have felt a certain amount of power and control and a certain calmness associated with the euphoria with his mother. And this would have been rewarding enough to propel him forward. But I feel that that form of euphoria, in contrast to many other serial killers, would have died out fairly quickly after the incident. Despite overwhelming evidence of his guilt, Harold Shipman continued to maintain his innocence and shield the motives of his crime even in prison. When Fred first went into prison, my wife started to correspond with him because, you know, she firmly believed that he was innocent. There are round about 25 letters which um, were written. In all the letters, uh, there's obviously no reference to the fact that he's admitting to anything at all. He was definitely trying to keep as much normality about his um, actions as he possibly could so that anything that people might come up with about what he's supposed to have done seemed totally illogical. He'd been to a house, rolled the sleeve up, administered morphine, killed her. That's what happened, isn't it, Doctor? No. Was Harold always maintained his innocence to me. Um, he never once, as far as I know, to, to me or any of the other prisoners, admitted to the guilt of actually murdering any of the patients. The levels were such that this woman actually died from the toxicity of morphine 
not as you wrongly diagnosed. In plain speaking, you murdered her. No. When Dr Shuman was finally convicted, uh, my wife was very upset and I said, well, there's only one thing you can do. I said, you can't write to the guy. I said, I think, you know, judging by the amount of evidence that's been put forward and the time it's taken, I said, I think it's pretty conclusive that he is guilty. I remember when they first tried charging him for 218 murders on top of what they already accused him of. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever actually seen him react to, the, to his trial on what was going on. And I remember when he came back from court, uh, he just broke down in tears and was explaining to me what had gone. And he said, they're trying to pin another 218 murders on top of me. I mean, he said, I don't, I don't know where it's coming from or where they're getting the evidence from or anything, you know, where they're getting these stories, he used to call them. Um, and that was the first time I'd actually seen a reaction from him. Um, he smashed his cell up, basically. He just went berserk. Harold Shipman never admitted to his crimes. Not to prison warders, not to prison inmates. Harold Shipman maintained the act that he'd started in childhood, where he, as it were, acted out the role of a social person, where he acted out the role of the good doctor. He could not, at the end of his existence, change that, because if he had admitted that he had done this, he would unpick and undo the fabric of his entire life, which was built on a facade. In an extraordinary turn of tables, Shipman saved his cellmate's life. I was so scared of being in a cell with Dr Shipman because of the reputation. The rest of the prisoners used to, was it saying to me, that's that, not so he's that doctor that's killed all them pa patients, like, you know what I mean? Um, I was in fear for my own life. So much, I, I took, I attempted to take my own life himself because I, I was that much scared, like, you know what I mean? He cut me down and resuscitated me. But after that, we seemed to get on pretty well. If he was so intent on murder, if that was his pleasure, why didn't he leave me to die? Shipman had a particular victim type with a method of killing them that he was comfortable with in locations, again, either the victim's territory or somewhere where he was in control. The guy he revived was most certainly not um, sick in, in, in the clinical sense. He um, was not the preferred victim type of Shipman. And I think Shipman probably did then the only decent thing he'd ever did is becoming a doctor. Instead of taking lives, he saved one. I'm still confused, um, because like I can't understand as a man such as Harold, like I say, as, to me as a friend, how he could have gone about doing it. All those people, I mean, it, it's not no, something. I mean, it's not a natural thing, is it, to take human life? To many of Dr. Shipman's victims, his suicide is a final betrayal. Not only did he kill their loved ones but he escaped the punishment of spending the rest of his natural life in prison. I think Fred planned his suicide. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. I think he knew about the fact that Primrose would be uh, financially better off if he died before a certain age. He made sure Primrose was well looked after, and again, he was winning the game, and he was, um, he was beating the authorities. Um, not only that, he was taking his secrets to the grave. I think one of the main issues with regard to Harold Shipman was that he was a doctor. We all learn from a very early age that doctors are to be trusted. From the evidence we have, the question is, was Harold Shipman born to kill? When we look back at his early life, we see a trait that seems to run through. That trait seems to make him objectify people, stops him feeling the feelings of others in the way that we do and call empathy. He also seems to have prevented him from normal childhood development, to created a world of fantasy, to actually have led and helped certain incidences in his life where he adopted the role of a GP, of a trusted person, who then went on to kill people rather than prolong their lives. Yes, it would seem that without that early characteristic, none of the other events would have had sufficient impact to actually lead 
to that line of behaviour, therefore it would seem that Harold Shipman was, in fact, born to kill. How do I feel towards him now? Indifferent. <laughs>